security requirements, technologies, and then we focus more on the spectrum. So today we finish this part talking about two other technologies that are emerging um, in 5G. Uh, one is called LSA, License Shared Access, and another one is called Cloud Run, Cloud Radio Access Network. In the afternoon, we'll start with the second module, which is about physical layer. Um, so there's going to be a few things I'm going to tell you there, some uh, novel waveforms and um, and uh, massive MIMO. So we'll start that today and I plan to finish that on Monday. And then we'll have a uh, couple of days, um, well one day actually, especially working on uh, studying the topologies, so heterogeneous networks, small cells. I'll also tell a bit more about small cells and how you can study them with uh, stochastic geometry in, in the beginning of the module four. And module four is mostly about new insights, uh, fundamental, uh, like uh, more fundamental work, let's say on, on the theoretical side and how it can impact actually 5G networks. I'll, I'll always keep, you know, um, relating whatever I present to 5G. So anything I present, let's say from the short term topics to the more, let's say, blue sky research. Uh, the plan is always to kind of relate it to 5G if possible. Okay, and um, there are two exams, right? One is coming soon, so we'll have one on Tuesday, the 28th, right, of June, from 2 to 2.45, it's about 45 minutes exam. It's going to be 10 questions, multiple choice, okay? And then we'll have another exam, um, the last day of the course, still two to three okay and um, um, again same same uh, story so 10 questions multiple choice um, I will tell you until when uh, I cover until what lecture I cover in an exam okay so I will definitely not cover in an exam what we do this the very same day um, but I will cover up to the day before okay so what you will find in the quiz on Tuesday is going to be up uh, comprising what we do up to Monday and the same with the last exam right but the last day is not uh, I mean the day of the exam is not included in the quiz of course hmm? okay any question about the logistics of the course no hope it's more or less clear um, okay so we are we are first to discuss a bit about um, um, the value chain so value chain in the sense of uh, mobile network operators so you do have basically a few um, blocks you see in this in this arrow so you do have bands uh, which traditionally are licensed so you pay you basically participate to an auction and if you win the auction you get the spectrum right that's what operators uh, do uh, to get uh, that's what Airtel or Vodafone or you know any other operator do to get their spectrum to operate on then you have the radio access networks, which is basically, as the name says, is how you access the, the rest of the network by, ra by radio. And then you have the sides, the masts, antennas, and so on. You do have the backhaul. Um, so you see it from left to right, we move more and more towards core network and then, uh, um, and then basically uh, even uh, up to, say, things that we normally don't deal with as telecom engineers, so like how you build um, the service how you basically create the service package, uh, how you brand, so right, we are not going to focus on this, but these are all part of the, va of the value chain. So it's like how you add value, starting from the basic technology up to the service delivered to the users. Um, so the main message here is that there is pretty much um, a static situation. So you get a certain band and it's yours and you do whatever you want. You have some, some set of base stations and infrastructure you it's yours and you do whatever you want now it turns out that this is not exactly a very good idea because of the increase in demand and because of the increase in costs of technology okay it's becoming very very expensive to run a network so people are starting to consider the possibility to share right uh, and the two um, entities we are going to consider in this uh, lecture uh, that are shared are spectrum and um, what we call remote radio heads, basically um, uh, antennas which have pretty much only the RF part, okay? And then all the processing is done in a central unit, right? Sometimes you hear about this uh, as um, a coordinated multipoint, sometimes you hear about it at, um, as um, 
um, yeah, Cloud Run or uh, Front Hall. So it has different names, so they all mean more or less the same story. So there are some emerging uh, issues, some emerging, say, trends. Uh, for example, um, there are some uh, service providers, say Netflix, which I understand is in India too, right? Like this basically website in, uh, uh, and um, you register, you pay a monthly fee and then you can watch on demand uh, streaming. Basically, you can watch any video series, movie and documentary and so on. There are others. There is a nice one if you're interested. It's called Curiosity Stream. And this is just about documentaries related to science and technology. It's very good. It's like very specific and you know, but the concept is similar to Netflix and then and then others. Um, so what these guys do, they do provide uh, the basically the, the service, but they do not own anything pretty much. They do not own the spectrum, they do not own the infrastructure, the antennas, the backhaul. So they use in a sense the um, infrastructure to provide their own service. That's why they're called over the top over the top, okay, because they are on top of the existing infrastructure. Um, that's one thing. Another thing that is uh, emerging, um, it's the, um, uh, basically the um, concept of mobile virtual network operator. So you have an added V into the acronym, so it's not MNO, it's MVNO, it's virtual. And in this case, uh, again, you are not necessarily uh, basically uh, owning say the, the, the spectrum and infrastructure you might just own a part of the value chain you know and you use uh, the other one um, so this emerging there are uh, there is an example in uh, in uh, UK and Ireland which is called uh, Tesco network Tesco is a chain of supermarkets and they also provide um, uh, a mobile phone service as um, as a virtual operator and uh, anybody that knows of any virtual operator in India? Vir Virgin, right? Yes. So that's probably the only one, right, uh, of a national relevance. Yeah. So Virgin Mobile is doing that. So they basically use, okay, the, um, the, the infrastructure and the spectrum provided by others and they use it for their own service. Now there are, I'm not into the business part of the story, I suppose there are some uh, agreements, right? They will probably pay a fee, or they will, right? They will rent. It's like they rent the f the, the network and they provide their own service. Um, can even be more extreme than this. You can also have what we call um, service providers. Okay, um, so service provider would not even be running the network. So you have like the manufacturer providing the infrastructure. You have the network operator running the network, like uh, Airtel. But you can also have service providers. So again. You could have another layer of um, of virtualization where you uh, you use the services provide not the services but the functionalities provided by the net network operator and you provide your own service. Okay. Uh, for example, you can imagine if uh, if you have a company that wants to distribute digital content on mobile phones, they could use the network of Airtel to provide their own service. Right. So there are many things happening in terms of the business side of the story. You also have complementary value chains uh, nowadays where you have um, um, networks based on Wi-Fi, like Google is doing a project, uh, Google Fi I think it's called, right? And they have a lot of, uh, it has a lot to do with Wi-Fi usage. Um, uh, so you can, I mean, part of uh, these emerging issues is also related to what we're going to say today. So uh, let's say it's basically a way to share the spectrum. It could be radar band, as we discussed yesterday. But um, I mean, yesterday we basically talked more in, the st in terms of the normal cognitive radio. So where you have um, a secondary, in a sense, trying to sneak in, not disturbing the primary. LSA is different in the sense that you are perfectly legitimate, um, per perfectly legit as a as a um, user of that spectrum. Okay, so you enter in an agreement with uh, uh, supervised by the government, where you basically might pay a fee or might not depend on the on the arrangement. But you, the time um, for the time and the region where you are allowed to use the band, nobody else will. So this is what we call exclusive sharing. Okay, 
so exactly something in between license and non-license. So many things are happening in terms of the spectrum. Also in terms of the infrastructure, uh, because of this influence of the cloud paradigm, now in a sense you could pick and choose which terminals, which antennas uh, you want to use to provide your service. Okay, and for example, if you have users in a certain area, you might just think to activate a part of the cloud run. If your users are somewhere else, you might activate another part. Okay, so you are not you are, you are not in a sense deploying the network. You are using it, and you pay a fee uh, um, according to the usage. Okay, so you are again tr uh, virtualizing the resources. To your users, doesn't matter because it will look like uh, as if you own the resources. Doesn't matter. Okay, but to you is different because you don't have the deployment costs as an operator you pay pro possibly actually much less than just buying the spectrum or you know buying the infrastructure or deploying it so you are actually paying uh, a rent fee in a sense okay usage fee so what is the yeah um, there are a few uh, models so for example uh, i think in lsa normally what happens is that um, it's a database driven approach so the um, incumbent will inform the database when it does not need the spectrum and where okay so in that region then then there is a mecha we're going back to this but there is a mechanism informing the um, mobile network operator that now they can use it so in that time and in that region nobody else will okay so it's what we call ex exclusive sharing so it's very different than wi-fi and wi-fi everybody can use it right anywhere here is different so it's kind of trying to get more spectrum but still guaranteeing the quality of service and not having to pay the fee that you have normally to pay to get licensed spectrum right um i think spectrum sharing is a very broad term so you know today i focus more on this lsa concept but yesterday we also talked about um uh, you know an, a form of sharing now we didn't uh, uh, mention LSA we probably in that work refer more to the US uh, framework which is called SAS spectrum access um, ser service I think right and it in in spirit it's very similar to LSA they just have an additional um, layer which we don't consider in our work which is called um, generalized general authorized access so where again it looks like a bit uh, Wi-Fi. So if the first two tiers, incumbent and uh, say uh, licensee operators like the secondary won't use the spectrum, then uh, potentially any Wi-Fi access point could use it. You know, so it's going to be unlicensed. Uh, so there, it, there are you know a few flavors, but in the main, the 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 trend in the new. Um, sharing paradigms is that you want to provide quality of service to the secondary users in a sense it this is a uh, more down to earth let's say um, sci-fi less you know dreaming version of cognitive radio but it, it is happening so this is going to be this is actually very seriously considered consi um, considered by you know the um, considered by the um, um, regulatory entities like ofcom and fcc ITU, you know, they are, and ETSI is like the standard uh, body in Europe. They are all having LSA in the agenda or the SAS in US. So it is the first time that Cognitive Radio is really making it to the systems. Okay, and why? Because this time it is viable for operators to use this um, uh, approach because they are, they are guaranteed quality of service. Okay, that's the main discriminant compared to the cognitive radio right cognitive radio was more a loss for them either they would share with somebody or they could get spectrum but not really reliable in this case they get additional spectrum at a lower cost and still with good quality of service um, of course it's not forever so at some point you might have to give it back so it's more like to increase your capacity adding some spectrum right so but you still have to have your uh, dedicated license spectrum right to, to provide let's say a stable um, operation then you you add these when you need mm. um, there are other approaches to sharing uh, one for example i'm not going to cover in my in my course is called lte unlicensed or laa licensed as uh, assisted access i think yeah and 
this is uh, mostly I think championed by Qualcomm okay and that, let's say instead was originally intro introduced by NSN and Qualcomm so companies are very much behind this and this uh, LTE unlicensed practically means that you have LTE operation in unlicensed bands hmm? so you will have of course again a quality of service problem but practically what they say is that since they can use the capabilities of uh, 4G, 5G they can be for example with massive MIMO very directional so they would increase a lot the receive signal and that would compensate the interference you normally have in Wi-Fi bands okay so there are many different things happening definitely it's a very active area so for those of you that are looking for a topic or are interested in considering the spectrum part of the story in their PSDs I suggest you looked into this new spectrum regime so either SAS or LSA or LAA um, these are the main ones and they are kind of you know uh, revised cognitive radio but more practical you know and more quality of service oriented um, yeah so practically in terms of the resource sharing uh, what you see is that anything you can use for your network is a resource okay you have spectrum you have base station backhaul storage processing sensors anything so you would have something like a resource aggregator deciding what what to use based on the requests of uh, either the virtual network operators or of the service providers so you see it's a much more fluid picture compared to what we are used to in telecom right um, and I'm not touching uh, a big part of the story because I don't work on that which is the softwareization in a sense of uh, of the network and that's mostly tackled at the moment by fixed network people okay the people working on SDN uh, so software defined networks on um, open flow on um, network function virtualization NFV and others they work a lot with these concepts say so, okay I think wireless we are still a bit lagging behind but it's picking up and eventually the idea is that you would have a sort of network operating system you know it's like uh, as, as in, a, in an operating system in your computer you, it would basically use the resources available to provide right some performance here's the same thing of course there are also business considerations like how much it costs so there are there is a lot of work to do with um, pricing the things mm? with uh, um, you know but I, again I don't I don't work too much on that we're going to see a tiny bit of pricing in this course but not an awful lot mm? so that's the general picture there are uh, actually I if you're interested in the main say setup uh, in the main uh, uh, ideas uh, behind this um, this virtualization and resource sharing I suggest this paper it's a paper where uh, two of the senior professors of my group uh, are the lead authors so there is the professor actually that gave you the talk the IEEE talks um, this week and then the director of my center professor Linda Doyle I'm not part of this work but it, it is a very good um, I think starting point to understand more about this okay and then um, now uh, another you know so I try to give some tip to young scholars you know about how to go about research when you find a paper which interests you it might be a good idea to check on Google Scholar who cited that paper because you get kind of the history right so for example this paper is 2014 there are, there are probably other works that are building on that and citing this paper so you can track in a sense right the the chain of, of work and that that would be helpful so any paper you're interested in that is not exactly published right now you should check also what happened afterwards right so it's also good for your state of the art in the thesis and the publications and definitely to inform your work because you know this is a snapshot right but things have been happening in the last two years so in general keep keep an eye on what uh, what what's going on oh yes Mm -hmm. be giving more priority than the actual user of the network. Correct. Uh, that is not no, but you, you don't need the, um, I mean, your point is uh, it's more convenient for the secondary than, than for the primary, right? Um, yes, but you know, the point is this is um, not, uh, I mean, you wouldn't need the resource in that moment. So it's like, you know, in a sense, you're sub renting like you have an apartment which is yours and then 
you are off the country, you are out of the country for half a year, and then you somebody else is using it, and you normally, uh, I mean, normally I think the rent is lower, right? the sub rent is lower generally, so, or at least not not higher than than what you pay, and um, so for you it's still added money, right? Because you get you get money, and uh, the person is happy, and you don't need the apartment at that point, and the same is here, right? So um, now. In fairness, LSA is not necessarily it's not necessarily something that will bring a lot of money into the pockets of the incumbents. It might simply be that the go the government will 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 tell them you have to do it. So if you are not using your band a lot, and most of these incumbents li like Raiders and so on are not, if you want to get to preserve your bandwidth, you also have to share with other uh, networks and. Uh, your award for doing that is that you keep using the band with yourself. You see my point? So uh, it's m more of um, you keep using it uh, reward. Mm? But in general, you will not uh, uh, share the bandwidth even in LSA when you need it. So if you need it, it's yours, and then you kick out uh, anybody else. Okay? But if you're not using it, then you inform the database, and then the other guys will come and use it. There, is, there are requirements about what is called evacuation time. So how much time you have to, uh, you have to, uh, for leaving the network when the incumbent is back, and it's normally not a huge time. It's like we are talking in the order of one minute. Because very, you know, if I need the bandwidth very quickly, the the secondary would be uh, removed uh, from from the band. So in a sense, this is very much. A system that you know, uh, yeah, of course, it's meant to help the secondary systems, but it also protects quite a lot the so primary. Yeah. Yes. 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 Correct. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, that's a good question, and that's something I'll, I'll try to tackle in, in the uh, you know the next part of this lecture. The, we have been studying a combination of Cloud Run and LSA Spectrum to exactly prevent this kind of problem. So what you could do, uh, say if you get um, a reduction in the spectrum you are using, you can use more antennas. Okay, you can because there is a trade-off, so not in the complete trade-off. So there is also some. Uh, you know, um, some actually intersection between the two, but let's say in general, if you use more spectrum, you can use less antennas and vice versa. We're going to see this, okay? So you could cope uh, like that, um, or you could look for another band, I don't know, but you know, normally, let's say if you have, say, availability of, um, uh, for example, uh, these remote radio heads and LSA spectrum, you can trade the two, okay? And there are some considerations to do with the cost, right? How much it costs to use the antennas and how much it costs to use the, um, the spectrum. Hmm? So depending also on the market fluctuations, it might be better off with one resource rather than the other. So it's not just, you know, the incumbent ruling. It's not just technical uh, issues. So what we are going, in fact, to, to discuss uh, later on is cost efficiency, which is throughput divided, divided by the cost. So it's not only throughput, right? There is also the cost component, which is very important. Uh, how often these um, there are, I think, you know, if you check like the documents from Etsy, there are um, indications. Uh, I can't give you like a single number. I think definitely uh, we are talking a bit slower time scale, okay, so possibly, I would imagine, I mean, if the evacuation time is one minute, then, you know, I would guess it's a bit longer than that, right, so, but that's probably a parameter that you can set, I don't think there are very specific technical requirements, it's more probably of a um, uh, regulation question, right, so how much they want to protect the incumbent, I suppose, because, you know, the problem is if you um, allow secondary users to use your spectrum and you get at some point uh, a need to reclaim the spectrum you should not wait too long right so I think um, you know it shouldn't be uh, a huge amount of time and it should be 
you know, reasonable in comparison with the evacuation time. Um, if you want specific number, I can dig it out. Okay, but there are there are documents that probably will tell you a bit more about that. Um, I mean, one thing, for example, I can tell you is that normally, um, like LSA is considering to, in a sense, to redistribute the new spectrum to network operators. Hmm? And the network operator, in turn, would have its own cells, right? And then its, its cell would have the users to serve. So the, the time frame we are talking about when you have a cell serving the users is about a millisecond, right? Or a few milliseconds, according to LTE. Then the time you you basically you, you, you the time scale where you coordinate the spectrum allocation between cells is definitely longer than that, right? It could be hours, I suppose, right? So if you now talk about LSA, you are talking about reallocating the spectrum uh, between uh, operators, and I don't imagine that would happen every hour, right? So probably it's a day long, a few days long, right? So um, and I think, in general, also the, um, the operation of an incumbent is not changing every second, right? So you might have, a, for example, if you're a radar uh, working for the army, you might have, of course, to run some operations. So you want to, be, to have that zone of limit. But I don't think this is going to change every half an hour. Now the, the defense people might confirm this, right? You have some, of course, some activities and some, but nothing that will, ha will, ha will happen, you know, uh, all of a sudden, right? So you do have time to, to plan accordingly. So I think this, you know, design of the database update is, is an interesting problem. We didn't tackle it too much, but it, it's probably something worth looking into if you're interested. Um, now, what happens in um, if you combine, uh, let's say if you use Cloud Run, is that you have basically these uh, remote radio heads, right? And they are connected uh, via f a fiber link to what we call uh, a centralized uh, basement processing center and these uh, BBUs boxes are the base basement um, units hmm? so for example Netflix or say an M2M service like a machine to machine service could share the capabilities of um, of the basement uh, processing center and the remote radio heads right um, so they don't necessarily need to be in the same number, so you can get a few BBUs and a few antennas, right? It's like the cloud. So you will get hold of some uh, radiating elements and of some um, uh, basically proce processing units, right? And then you will do your, uh, you will provide your service. And this is, you see, this is a pool where people, wh where the different service providers could actually uh, choose from to provide their service okay how do they choose well it's a tra it's a combination of the quality of service and the um, the profit right they have also they want also to spend l uh, little money um, here we talk about MD MIMO supercell MD MIMO stands for massive distributed MIMO so you have a lot of these uh, remote radio heads hundreds in a certain area and then you activate a, a radiating element if for example your users are nearby Right. If your users are in a completely different location, you don't need that specific radiating element. And depending on how much processing you have to do, you will also pick the um, BBU, um, the baseband uh, units. Yeah. So, in a way, isn't this actually happening? I mean, in yes. Also, okay. So there are few units which are dedicated for government because of regulation. Mm -hmm. Correct. Do you mean this cloud run? Uh, no, no, of course. No, no, it has been there. I mean, you know, and uh, China, for example, has been a front runner in this. So there are a lot of projects. Now, I think what what is new in this work I'm presenting is that we also consider this new spectrum sharing. But cloud run definitely has been there for a while. Yes. Uh, I'm not too sure it's still a dominant technology in 4G, but it is considered to be one of the um, main technologies um, in 5G. So it is going to be there for a while. Yeah, and I mean, to my knowledge, China has really been pushing a lot for this. Um, you see, there is, uh, in a sense, uh, a bit of schizophrenia in the 5G story because 
I mean, what happened until 4G is that the intelligence was always pushed as much as possible to the edge. Okay, so you had basically in 4G you have base stations which are very capable, and they can do a lot of the functionalities before it had to be done somewhere else in the um, in the network. Now with cloud running, in a sense, you go back, right? Because you 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 in a sense move again the intelligence closer to the core of the network, and you leave very little capabilities available in the remote radio head. Now. I don't think it's an exclusive war. You will have a bit of both. So you have trends towards more and more distributed intelligence with sensors, small cells, right, machines. Uh, but for example, in some scenarios where you have to cover a campus, a hospital, you know, a cloud run might work very well. You have, in fact, like one, uh, it's not exactly the same thing, but a similar stories with the distributed antenna systems, DAS. And they, they are normally meant to cover, for example, multi-stories buildings, right? So you have a radiating element per story, and then they are all kind of coordinated by a central unit. So um, I imagine if the scenario is uh, with reasonable um, uh, densities, and you know, you do need, um, let's say, to, in a sense, to coordinate what happens, um, you know, and there is, there are not too many actors deciding, for example, couple in this case, then cloud run is probably a good choice, right? It's kind of you have control of the situation. But if you start to have too many nodes, you know, and too many actors taking decisions and service providers, um, then probably cloud run wouldn't be a good idea, I think, okay? There is also some delay involved with processing information. So if you have to take too complicated decisions, then you start to have delay issues with um, cloud run. It also depends on the data uh, you have to transmit. Uh, so there are some limits in the fiber capacity and delay, but normally they are very, very, you know, good compared to what we are used to in wireless. So I don't think there is a unique answer. You know, the both both approaches are being considered, and possibly you will need both, right? Because you might you might think to a multi-layer situation where you have cloud run, and then let's say the radiating element might be relaying or being you know the um, the hub for a small network so you might have multi c run or you might have even situations where you have c run and then if there is a too high a density you might have a much more distributed approach right um, so i think there is always going to be a part of the processing which is going to be centralized mm -hmm. and there is probably a part of the processing will be distributed okay so i don't think there is one architecture uh, only No, I don't. I don't think so. I think you know. I think Cloud Run will integrate um, the current deployments. You know, and uh, in fact, it's not even sure that this frontal approach is the winning one because Alcatel Lucent has been investigating something else called mi called mid hole, which is in between back hole and front hole. So I don't think it's very settled at the moment. You know, um, and you you will. S I mean, first of all, you will have 4G active, right? That is going to stay. Um, and I think things like small cell deployments, I, I doubt they can be benefiting a lot from Cloud Run. But there's simply too many elements, too much processing involved. So uh, I think base stations will actually maybe evolve into small cells mostly. Um, I don't expect a huge increase in the coverage of macro cells. That's kind of providing the coverage we need right now. So I think I expect more of these uh, local deployments like microcells, pico cells, small cells, but again, these are very intelligent nodes. Okay, they are not following this dumb RRH approach. Okay, uh, scenarios where I can think of cloud run being useful is hospitals, campuses. Um, okay, and uh, possibly, yeah, I mean uh, situations where there are not so many actors taking decisions, right? It's always, if you go back to the lecture of Professor Da Silva, even theoretically, you have two approaches to things, okay? You have an approach which is uh, of an optimization nature, central entity deciding, right? A genie knowing it all and taking the best decision ever. And then you have a, uh, an approach which is more distributed. Game theory is an example. We're going to see some examples from complex systems later in this course. These are all belonging to this more, say, uh, distributed uh, situation. In fairness, complex systems can also be used for central decisions, but uh, let's say a big part of it is this 
autonomous agents deciding okay so if you have reasonable um, if you have a reasonable time frame okay so in a sense it doesn't take you too long to collect information and take a decision centralized approaches are going to be better so it depends on the density also right and how much exchange of information is there if you start to have gazillions of uh, radio heads I don't think cloud run would work very well right so because it will take simply too long before you take a decision so in that case you might actually be better off maybe with um, multi-layer approach so you do cloud run up to some point but then maybe the local uh, you know uh, cluster of uh, machines or you know small cells might be better off with a more distributed approach right so it's not I don't think it's a black or white situation it's more of a gray uh, area correct I agree I fully agree and that's you know that's part of the story uh, I, I'm, I've been saying you know I, I think if you if you can provide uh, if you can make sure that the latency requirement is obeyed to then cloud run will make sense okay so for example local deployments right um, yeah covering a campus covering a building a hospital a business area right uh, where you have maybe one of these guys per room or per floor then I see the point uh, if you have um, you know so many that it takes too long to take a decision then you're better off with a s less centralized approach I, I agree in fact you know I mean the requirements don't imply just one set of technologies right there is the, the single one there is there is a pool right so you have cloud run but you have other things too right so and um, uh, it's also in a sense costly because we have to provide a very good backhaul to these guys right a very uh, optical fiber so now for example fan to cells uh, Wi-Fi they use very sloppy backhauls and they still work so it would imply a kind of big investment for operators right so there are definitely cost considerations so I suppose China is into that because the economy has been doing very well in China, right? Uh, in general, so they have money to invest. So probably Korea might be very much uh, upfront in that. But you know, again, depends on how, what is the budget, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm not touching this in this in this course. Uh, um, I don't think so. But yeah, there is definitely this alternative. I mean, the microwave um, backhaul. Um, for example, one possibility uh, is to um, exploit uh, full duplex for that. So you might actually do access um, and at the same time, right, do do backhaul. Uh, so you might have these relays that basically are. Um, uh, are uh, so you can receive information and, and transmit it at the same time right so you would de reduce delay and it could become viable to have this sort of uh, wireless backhaul um, in general you can even have you can even think of things like uh, massive MIMO real, real massive MIMO so where you have massive MIMO on one end massive MIMO on the other end like huge towers providing a huge pipe of inf uh, data and that could be the case where you cannot deploy fiber or cables right for example in a forest I'm thinking like Amazon in Brazil or forest uh, forestal region in India so in that case it might, it might be better off having sort of wireless but I think it's an option um, you know the point is it's a bit it's a bit like what we said with optimization if you can do it if you can afford to do it it's better the same with fiber if you can afford to do it it's going to be better okay because the the data rates and um, errors uh, error performance you can get with fiber you cannot reach with wireless simple as that right as much as you push the wireless you're always lagging behind by four orders of magnitude right now we talk a gigabit per second in wireless those guys have been talking about terabit per second for for ages right so uh, you cannot compete on that ground but uh, for example for ease of deployment cost issues you know then yes then there is a point like the the wireless is kind of infrastructure light right compared to optical so again you know it's it's a uh, it's a landscape of trade-offs eventually fiber also in future if uh, data rate makes the 
Correct. Uh, I think, uh, like for example, the, my friend working in, in on optical networks in Dublin, they are definitely advocating that uh, you know a lot of work has been done, for example, in the uh, access part of the optical network, but not much in the core. And the core is like what really you know is the bottleneck in a sense. At some point, um, it might actually you know hinder uh, the further increase in throughput, also from the wireless side, right? And Normally, uh, in a sense, these are even more crucial decisions to make uh, for the um, for a, for a government because uh, you don't deploy a fixed network every day, right? Normally, when you deploy, I mean, maybe a wireless deployment might be uh, obsolete after 10, 15 years, but the infrastructure of the fixed part of the network will be there for 50 years, maybe. So, right, when you do it, you have to do it right. So, I think there are a lot of discussions now, a lot of proposals. I'm I'm not touching that in my in my course, but definitely people are aware, okay, and they are trying to, to do something. Uh, they try to make it also lighter. For example, some proposals, they skip the um, metro part of the network, so you do have huge, long, very long um, ducts connecting the core to the access directly. They call it long reach passive optical networks, LR pond. So there are, there are you know, some proposals to to cope with this, but in the main, I see a lot of work in the access on optical side. Uh, still not so much on the core. Other proposals involve local caching, local uh, content distribution to avoid overloading the core. Right. So there are people are working on that. Yeah. Just it's not my my research expertise. Okay. Um, so just to give an idea about the LSA um, architecture. So you have basically a um, few things. Okay, this is part of a. This this was proposed um, uh, by a European project I'm uh, I'm working on. There is a paper here which uh, will appear soon for publication if you're interested. Um, anyway, this reflects also other trends in LSA. Okay, it's, um, the main story is similar. So you have uh, LSA licenses which are the secondary networks and you can think of them for example as mobile operators not necessarily but these are the secondary hmm? these communicate with the block which is called a uh, band manager and will decide based on the rules it gets from the national regulatory authority nra based on the agreement of the sharing based on authentication okay based on resource availability it will decide what to do in terms of allocating the resources. So as, a, as a, an operator, as a licensee, you would request some resources, but then you might be given all you ask or not, depending on availability and other rules, right? Um, and billing is there, so you might actually have to pay a fee, right, for using it. Now, this is, the, um, is let's say, the LSA uh, core part, and then it communicates with a block called Radio Environment Map, which in essence takes uh, gets input from two things, the repository or database and the certain sensing network. So you see that all we've been talking yesterday kind of fits here, right? So in a sense, what I said, what I talked about yesterday is an example of, of a possible application of LSA. Um, and the repository would get input from the incumbents. They would tell their usage patterns in time, frequency, space. And the sensing would be actually uh, also contributing to refine this information. Normally, sensing could provide a finer picture in terms of time and uh, space, right? It's like more refined. Now, the sensing network could be either run by the um, uh, licensees, so by the secondary networks, or it could be run as an independent service. You could have a um, sensing provider. You could have somebody offering this as a service, and you know, you buy the service if you want. Okay, um, so in, in, in essence, that's, that's the picture. Any question about this? No. Um, yeah, so we can move on. Now, uh, how do you combine Cloud Run and LSA? Well, you do have, um, as we said before, uh, this uh, massive distributed MIMO supercell, or anyway, you have these remote radio heads, right? And then they communicate with the um, central uh, pool of uh, basement units which do the processing and as a virtual network operator what you could do is to buy the usage of antennas and to buy the usage of uh, processing power 
right? Or to buy the spectrum, right? Which in this case would be LSA, so it would be um, uh, like this uh, shared uh, spectrum, and you you could get, I mean, you request to the LSA band manager um, the spectrum you need, and then you might get get it or you might get less or nothing depending on the availability and then you, you basically pay a fee to use the spectrum and this fee might actually be uh, going back to the government or going to the um, incumbent or going to a certain LSA system providing the service now we didn't investigate that I suppose it's open okay who uh, th there are money to be made okay that's 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 a fact and then this is more into the business uh, domain which I normally don't work on so uh, so what we try to do here is just to model the cost in a general fashion and then you know who, who benefits from that cost okay uh, I don't know could be the cloud run operator so you, I mean the, the thing is you know you have to get away from the idea you have a mobile network operator doing everything it's likely in the future I mean these guys might be there but it's likely you will have many more of these virgin kind of operators which will actually buy their service from a cloud run operator, from um, a, an LSA operator, from uh, a backhaul operator, right? So, and uh, their business would be to provide the infrastructure or the spectrum. And your business is to provide the service hmm? um, or the operation of the network, anyway. Um, now, going a bit more into details, uh, if you look at the MIMO part of the story, uh, this is a, a kind of channel which we call MISO broadcast, multiple input single output, because you have many antennas at the um, transmitter, uh, and then you have uh, one antenna only at the, at the user side, okay? So we assume K users, and the requirement here uh, so that it works uh, is that you have to have more antennas than users. Hmm? M has to be greater than K. You assume uh, channel state information at transmitter because, in essence, what you do here is a precoding. It can be of different nature. In this study, we have used zero forcing, which is fair enough. You can do max uh, maximum ratio combining. You can do other things. Okay, zero forcing is normally a good choice. Hmm? It works. Okay. Any question about this? No. Sorry. Uh, well, it comes from the literature, really. They show it has good um, sum rate performance. It's not too complex. Uh, in, in what you do practically with uh, zero forcing, you, you, you perfectly invert the channel, right? So you kind of have, um, you know, if you take, for example, uh, if you multiply H inverse by H, you can get uh, a diagonal, right? So and that implies that you can separate the users perfectly. Hmm? Um, with uh, MRT, uh, it's uh, somebody calls it beamforming. Um, you basically use as a precoder the Hermitian, right, of H. So that's less uh, optimal. Okay. Um, I, I, I mean, in the literature I see really they push a lot for zero forcing because of some rate performance uh, essentially, and you know that comes from the fact that you have um, basically. Um, a perfect uh, separation of the users okay so in the limit um, in the limit uh, when the number of antennas tend to infinity the MRT would tend to become as good as zero forcing okay because of uh, you would practically get uh, the diagonal dominant uh, matrix when you multiply H emission by H so in the limit it works equally well but for lower number of antennas, if you focus on performance, um, it's better to use um, uh, zero force. And the problem with zero force is noise enhancement. So there are versions that use MMSE. In the main, I don't see big difference in, in this domain compared to the normal MIMO. Okay? There are just better gains due to the higher number of antennas. And normally in MIMO, in the 4G or 3G, you would assume multiple antennas of the users. 5G is more modest because eventually it didn't happen to have many antennas, uh, mo multiple antennas at the mobile. So now they assume normally one antenna per user. But all to do with pre-coding, multi-user MIMO, it still applies, okay? The, you just have a more, you have a closer to a, a situation which is closer to the asymptotic situation because of the high number of antennas. So 
multi-user interference become very small noise becomes very small but the main technologies are the same okay so I think zero forcing is um, is a good idea since with massive MIME you tend to have no no noise impact you don't necessarily need a MMC to see zero forcing is probably I mean from what I see they also have some way to regularize the precoder they call it uh, generalized zero forcing, I think, or regularized zero forcing, but in the main, it's still zero forcing. Yeah. That's the choice, I think, you, you get from the literature. Uh, the best, absolute best in terms of performance would be dirty paper, dirty paper coding, right? But that's not linear, it's very complex, so it's more of a theoretical bound. So you know how far you are from the bound comparing with dirty paper coding, but you don't see this as a choice in the actual implementation. So zero forcing is good enough. Okay, so there is, a, there is a theorem actually that tells you, in fact, the bound, okay, so the, the you can actually find out that the, the bound is provided by, by this expression, okay, where you have W is the bandwidth, K is the number of users, P is the power you transmit towards any user, so it's the power before the channel kicks in, mm. uh, and zero is the noise spectral density, okay. Uh, now this bound is especially tight, so you are it's it's a good approximation of the um, capacity. In uh, if the channel is well conditioned, okay, what does it mean? It means that you can easily tell the rows apart, right? And that implies in turn that you can easily distinguish the users, right? Um, now. In that's mathematically the definition, ma the mathematical definition. But in practice, what it means is that you have to have um, antennas that are not much correlated, right? And the good thing—that's true even with MIMO, right? So most in most cases, unless you do uh, specific things like beamforming. Mm. In general, you want the antennas to be spatial, spatially separated. Uh, so here, you don't have that problem because the antennas are not collocated, right? So you do have a much better situation in that sense. So it is true that the channel is well conditioned, therefore this bound is tight. Mm. The traditional approach to you know, optimize uh, the performance in this kind of system would be given the bandwidth, the number of views, the number of antennas and the maximum power, choose um, the precoding matrix F, right? That maximizes the total sum rate. So the total throughput you can transmit to every user. Um, such that you don't violate the power constraint, right? That's, I think, very common as a model. Many of you might, must have used it in your research. So do you see that what you do practically uh, here, you, you multiply your uh, transmit vector by the precoding matrix, then you have the channel, and that's what you receive, including the noise, right? Now, the, the um, Practically, though, we relax, uh, we kind of change the, the, g the rules of the game here. So we say, what happens if you can choose any number of antennas or any bandwidth from the pool of the LSA spectrum? Hmm? Ideally, to your, uh, I mean, to your eyes and the eyes of your users, it's like these resources are unlimited. Of course, they are shared. There are other operators, but practically, since you can pretty much get what you need, it's like it's as if it's uh, infinite, right? It's like um, you have a pool of money, but you, you only, you know, and this pool of money is shared. But at any time, you're guaranteed you can uh, withdraw any money you want. So it's as if uh, you have an infinite uh, sum of money available, right? Uh, it's as good as that. Same story here. Um, of course, uh, because you are not owning the thing, you are like using them and they belong to somebody else, maybe the cloud run operator, maybe the LSA operator, you have to pay a cost, like a um, usage fee. So we have a paper use cost model here. Um, now you pay something to use uh, the infrastructure, so the processing of the cloud, uh, some currency units per second, you can call it rupee, euro, dollar, doesn't matter. Uh, CM is the cost per antenna and CW is the cost per hertz. Okay, um, now we are interested more in the, um, let's say, uh, the relative behavior. What if the cost of the antenna is 10 times the cost of the spectrum? That's the um, uh, spirit of this study. 
we are not claiming we have a very precise model for the cost. That goes beyond our scope and expertise. That's what I said, the pricing of these things is a very interesting area of, of study. And, but for that, you need people into the, um, you know, the economics world, right? So we cannot come up with that expertise overnight. So you, there is uh, a big scope for collaboration with um, uh, business uh, economics guys here, I think. Because it changes the, the model networks might, might follow in the future. So you definitely need to talk with um, economics experts to get it right. So any, in any event, what we have now is different than what we saw before. So given the number of users, given the cost of using the cloud, of using the antennas, of using the spectrum, make sure you pick the bandwidth and the number of antennas so that your cost efficiency is maximized. What is cost efficiency? It is simply the um, um, uh, ratio between what we saw before, right? The capacity, the throughput, and the cost. Now, the cost per antenna and per unit of spectrum is, um, has to be multiplied by the total spectrum and total number of antennas used. The cost of, the, of using the cloud uh, it's, it's fixed, we assume, okay? So you either use it or you don't. Okay, you can change this possibly, but that's what we, we've been assuming. So just to give you an idea how things work, so if you basically have a situation where you have, say, 20 antennas available and 50 megahertz available, okay? <coughs> From the cloud run and uh, LSA spectrum pool, um, what we saw is that you know if you if you optimize the cost efficiency, I'm not going into the details of the optimization problem. It's pseudo convex, and you have to optimize first over the spectrum, then over the antennas, and you keep fixing one and optimizing over the other. So it's kind of suboptimal in that sense. Um, there are details in the paper I mentioned here. So the last one is about this work. Okay. So anyway, you have the rele the references if you're interested. Um, and what, what basically we see is that if you, if you optimize the cost efficiency, you get, um, uh, I mean, if you optimize the uses of spectrum and, and antennas, you get uh, a cost efficiency which is always on top of approaches that either use all the spectrum or all the antennas, so approaches that are uh, dumber in a sense, right? So if, you, if what you care is cost efficiency then uh, by you know adopting this approach you get it right okay so you you are going to of course it's not surprising right because you are optimizing cost efficiency i'm not saying this uh, you know you are um, astonished by the result but just to show you know that uh, the things work okay so you are definitely um, getting uh, a good um, result in terms of cost efficiency then you see of course that if you start to pay too much, in this case the spectrum, the cost efficiency will decrease because it's not going to be uh, a good deal at some point for you. Yeah? We also have uh, figures in the paper about what happens with the antenna cost. Mm? Uh, so it is a relative thing. So what we saw, for example, in other studies is that if you start to increase too much the cost of the spectrum, then you're better off using more antennas, of course. right? Um, in this case, we consider a continuous spectrum. We have another work submitted to Globcon considering a discretized spectrum, which is the normal case. You will get chunks of spectrum, right? Not a continuum. Uh, and that introduces some different behavior. So, you know, but these are details. In the main, I think this gives the idea. Okay, so to conclude this lecture, um, the current model for ownership and business of the mobile operators is not viable economically. It's simply too expensive to run a network, and the users are used to this flat rate uh, policy, so they don't want to pay more. They just want, want to pay a fee, whatever the, the consumption. And since they're getting more and more capable uh, devices, this is going to get worse. They still don't want to pay more, but they will use even more resources, right? So you do have to come up with a better solution than I build my network on my own and I run it on my own, because that's probably not going to work. And if you look at the... Um, forecasts in terms of the profitability of current uh, mobile operator businesses, they don't look good. Mm? They are really not uh, getting a big profit uh, at the moment. 
so the, the sharing uh, of the ownership might be the um, solution okay uh, of course if you if you use resources that are not yours only you pay somehow and so there is there are uh, interesting uh, business considerations about um, actually how much you should pay and who you should pay to right so there are all of these new actors entering the game like people that operate the spectrum people that operate the cloud run and 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 other things backhaul uh, and so you're definitely going away from a situation where you have the government running the fixed part and three or four big guys running the wireless part it's going to be much more fluid than that in the future and one thing that you know uh, to tell you that this is not exactly speculation is that big giants like facebook and google are very much knocking at the door of of mobile um communication uh, business right they are they're serious okay and they are already having projects they have a huge amount of budget they are giants very innovative very young people working there so I think in a sense either the mobile operators will change their mindset or they might succumb you know that that has been historically the case so the uh, in any institution so I think the the, the the change is going to be driven by the fact that these huge giants of the new uh, ICT uh, era are really serious okay so things are happening um, so cloud run we saw it it's a good candidate for sharing the resources it's a flexible platform in a sense allowing different trade-offs so in this case we saw antenna versus spectrum so either you use uh, more spectrum or you use more uh, antennas um, so if you for example you get requested to return the LSA spectrum you've been using you can use more antennas as so there is an inherent trade-off between um, the two other things we didn't study but could be of interest you can for example include power in the game okay so you can have also what happens if you use more or less power right again uh, you have a budget and you will uh, uh, pay more if you use more power right now the power is fixed okay for us um, yeah so there are many research challenges and open problems so i think the most interesting thing is that it's a general framework so you can for example fit in other works like the work we have been doing with um, on radar sharing can be as well part of this of this framework and we do have more advanced solutions currently being um, reviewed for publication including how you actually um, how you allocate the spectrum which could be an auction based mechanism okay so we have work on that we have work on uh, discretization of the spectrum we have some ideas about extending it into the power domain so there is a rich research space for those of you that are interested okay so I think we are good to go for lunch and in the uh, yes a couple of questions in the cost, uh, cost efficiency model yes uh, we have not included the revenue that you will get uh, yes Yeah, you mean the the people renting these things? Uh, what do they get? The quality, yes. Because of, because of uh, if you use more resources, yes. you can give, give a better quality of service. I think you're right, but in a sense, this is sort of incorporated in the numerator, right? Because if you get better resources or more, you will get also boost in the throughput. So you could say that you know you you get a certain revenue per bit right you you transmit so in it is it is a thing there okay yeah yeah it's, it's, it's throughput right so of course you can have other things now we didn't focus on delay right energy efficiency there are many things you can do but uh, at least there is an attempt to capture quality of service yeah.